ready to jump into the word. I believe I have a good word for y'all today. Straight from Jesus. This thing has been stirring in my heart for some time. So I'm excited to share it with you. We're going to go to the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 8 through 14. And I'm reading from the NLT. Mordecai gave Haddock a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all the Jews. He asked that Haddock to... He asked Haddock to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Haddock to direct her to go to the king to beg for for mercy and plead for her people. So Haddock returned to, to Esther with Mordecai's message. So the people were going to be killed. All the, all the Jews, were, their lives were be, being threatened. Genocide was at hand. So Mordecai was warning Esther that this was coming. So Esther told Haddock, go back and relay this message to Mordecai, all the king's officials, and even the people in the provinces, that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called me to come to him for 30 days. So she was, if she went before the king, she could have been killed. So Haddock gave Esther's message back to Mordecai. This poor guy was running back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> Mordecai sent his reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace now, don't think you're all high and mighty that you'll escape when all the Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives, you're still going to die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this, Esther? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would teach us, guide us, lead us, open hearts, open our ears of understanding today. In Jesus' name, we honor you and we love you. Amen. Amen. My message title for today is For Such a Time as This. So if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, that's what I want you to remember today. For Such a Time as This. Y'all, it's Mother's Day. I'm reminded of all the mothering stories. I don't know about y'all, but I get sappy on Mother's Day. I start looking through all of the old photo reels. Going back to year 2000 when I became a mom. That sounds so long ago. I feel really old. But I get all sentimental looking at the pictures. And I stumbled upon one of my son when he was five years old. And I was reminded of how, like, as a mom, you don't get just, like, birth a baby and then suddenly wake up with all of these skills and abilities. You kind of learn as you go, right? You don't know what you're doing. You end up rising to the occasion to be whatever you need to be for that moment, whatever the kids need in that season, whatever the situation is, you just rise to the occasion. You become a doctor. You become a nurse when you need to taking temperatures, wiping boogies, doing nasal, you know, rinses, whatever. Mamas, our lists don't end. We have to rise to the occasion, in and out of season. And I remember a time I went outside to check the mail. My son has ADHD, so I was always trying to, like, run him, get that energy out, right? So, I get, Jaden, take this basketball and come with Mommy to the, uh, to, the, to the mailbox. We go to the mailbox. I'm fishing through the mail. And my son, who was doing laps up and down the driveway, when I look up, he's gone. How many of y'all know the kids just disappear sometimes? Like, I just had my eyes on him. And suddenly I hear this commotion. Not only is he not in my driveway, he's in the next driveway over at the neighbor's house. And the neighbor comes out of her house, hot, fussing at my son, berating him with her words. He's five years old, y'all. She's like, you're in my yard. You shouldn't be here. That ball might mess up my garden. What? (laughs) Who? What? You talking to my baby? My five-year-old son who doesn't understand boundaries yet? 
I mean, the overreaction was so ridiculous. Y'all, something rose up inside of me. Anybody who knows me, I'm a peacemaker. I'm a number nine on the Enneagram, okay? I don't like trouble or conflict. But that mama bear rose up inside of me, and I was not going to have somebody talk to my son like that. And I walked right up her driveway, and I said, you know what? Do not talk to my son in that tone or in that manner. If you have a problem with my son, come find me. I'd be more than happy to help you. Jaden, let's go. And she was just like, ooh. She was taken aback by me because this little peaceful neighbor, something rose up inside of me. Come on, where my mom is at? Y'all know. Come on, Baltimore. Come on, Columbia. Y'all know. Don't act like you don't know. When that mama bear rises to the occasion, she knows what instantly what she's supposed to be. Instantly, she's a leader. Instantly, Mama Bear knows to defend. Instantly, we know how to nurture and guide and protect our children, the next generation, and so on and so forth. Instantaneously, we can go from people who have to, who um, are, like for me, I birthed this baby in the natural, but then I, it went from birthing something in the natural to birthing purpose in my kids every single day. And what I've learned about Mother's Day is that this maternal instinct that I feel, I was talking to someone the other day, she's not a mom, She's like, I'm not a mom, but I feel this maternal instinct rise up to nurture, to defend, right? I'm like, it's in all of us. It doesn't matter your gender, church. This instinct to nurture, defend, protect, it's in all of us. So this message is not just for the ladies. It's for the gentlemen, too, because we've got some purposes in this next generation to facilitate, amen? Some purposes of God. Because I'm not hearing my babies cry for me to grab them and uh, take care of them and feed them anymore, right? They're older, they're grown. I hear the cries of a generation that is motherless and fatherless. I hear the cries of a generation that are longing for someone to connect with them, to encourage them, to show them how to do life and how to do this God thing. This generation is crying out for authenticity and transparency. Do y'all hear it? I hear it in the spirit, man. We have to rise to the occasion, church, for such a time as this, to be the mentors that our gener the next generation needs, to be the shepherds and the mother and father to the fatherless and the motherless to the orphans. This is what God is calling us to do in this season. Rise to the occasion. Esther had to rise to the occasion. If she didn't, a whole generation, all her people would have been lost. See, King Xerxes, back in that time, he was a king at that time. He was super powerful, had a huge feast, 180 days. And you know what? He, here he is. He brings, uh, uh, he calls for Vashti, his queen. He's like, come before me. I want to parade you in front of everyone and show you off. And she said, no, I'm not coming. So he got hot. He divorces her. He's mad. He's like, we got to set an example here. So he, all the, his officials say, we're going to get you a new bride. So they go out into the kingdom and they gather all these women. They start preparing these women with nine-month beauty treatments, all kinds of stuff. Can you imagine being dipped in myrrh for nine months? Whew, that doesn't sound too bad. Hopefully moms were going to get pampered today. I should have scheduled a massage now that I'm thinking about it. Anyway, sidetrack treatments, all this kind of stuff. They're preparing Esther to go before the king. She doesn't know that she's going to be called to rise to the occasion and make a decision, save her life or save the lives of the people, her people, the Jewish people who were looked down upon. 
you know? And like her uncle, her cousin, Mordecai, who adopted her because she was an orphan, he said, you know what? I know you were born Hadassah. That was her Jewish name that she was born. But when she went into the palace, she had to go by the name Esther, which meant hidden and conceal. Hidden. Conceal your name. Don't tell the people what your name is in the, uh, in, in the palace because they'll kill you. So here we have a situation. She's in the palace. She goes before the king, and the king finds favor with her. Esther never imagined herself being queen, but she had to rise to the occasion and be what she needed to be or her, a generation would be lost. Y'all, we have a generation out there making impossible decisions for their lives. I say impossible because they don't know their true identity. They don't know, we're in a society where these kids, our kids are growing up watching TV, TikTok, YouTube, and YouTube and TikTok and social media are raising them. Literally telling them who they are, what they should look like, who they should be. Aimless, they're walking around. Hopeless, walking around. Fatherless and motherless, like lost sheep. That's what's happening. And we're not doing it intentionally as an older generation. We're, we work. We're busy. We don't have as much time. We're stressed, whether you're in an, stressed with work, stressed, stressed because your marriage isn't working out, stressed because um, uh, you're in an, an addiction, perhaps. You're not, get, we are not giving the generation behind us the time to the emotional margin we, that we don't have. We don't have emotional margin, so we don't, give, we don't have anything to give them. So they're walking around fatherless and motherless, nobody to guide them, direct them, shepherd them, tell them how to make decisions, how to conceal their name if they need to to save their lives, like Mordecai did. We've got to consider the fact that we have a problem and we have an opportunity to intervene. We have an, we have an opportunity to sh be the ones who shape the next generation's identity. You with me, church? You want to be a part of that movement to shape the next generation? What a call. Because we have a problem. We've created a tolerance for amoral behaviors. So we have a generation walking around boundaryless, insecure, unstable, powerless to take a stand for who they are in God. We're frustrated with our kids. We're so frustrated with them, the decisions they're making, why they're choosing to do whatever it is that they're choosing to do. But we don't realize, church, that rules without relationship equal rebellion. I'm going to say that again. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. You're expecting them to smell like you, sound like you, act like you, right? But you haven't spent any quality time with them. There's no relational equity or investment. We've got to invest in shaping them. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. So how can we rise to the occasion? Um, I want to leave you with a couple thoughts today if you're taking notes on how we can rise to the occasion to help this next generation own their identity. Everybody say, for such a time as this. Say it stronger. One more time, Baltimore, Columbia. This is what God has called us to. Number one, to engage in a greater purpose in the next generation. I've got this crazy friend. How many of y'all got crazy friends that make you do stuff that you, you know, wouldn't normally do? <laughs> I've got a crazy friend. She's here. She's one of the executive pastor's wives. Her name is Lori Dodson. And in 2013, first of all, she had by that time convinced me to run three half marathons. And um, she's like one of those people when she's running with you, she's like, come on, let's go, get it. She's got so much grit. 
So here we are, crazy people, decide to do this one race called Tough Mudder. Tough Mudder is like a, a 10 to 13 mile obstacle course with military style obstacles on it. It took us four hours. This was one of the hardest things I'd ever done in my life. And you know what's crazy? It had like sh things that shocked you. You had to, you know, do these um, uh, monkey bar things and run up a half pipe and climb haystacks. Like this was intense, y'all, okay? I had so many bruises and bumps and scratches all over me. I remember we, just when they were about to start the race, there's a six foot wall in front of us. I'm like, why is there this blockade before we start the race? Suddenly the gun goes off and I see people flying over this wall and I'm like, what in the world? People are going over this thing. And Lori goes up first she, and she looks down and she's like, come on, Irene. She had to get up the wall so she could help me get over it. Then I had to do the same for the person following behind me. See, this race of life is not about you. It's about the people that are coming behind you. And you have got to get up the wall. Your purpose is to get up the wall, just like Lori's was, so she could help me over it. Y'all, someone died on this particular race. He was actually from Odenton, bless his soul. Y'all, people can die in this race of life. God needs you for such a time as this. God needs you to help someone else over the wall. You've got to get over the wall so you can help someone else engage in purpose, get them over the wall. Amen? Another uh, season, I did something crazy. In 2013, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I summited 19,341 feet. Highest freestanding mountain in Africa. Amazing journey. I learned so much. I pushed, I was pushed past my limits. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with a lady named Cindy Zello. She had done this before. She knew what like the best strategy was, what equipment I should bring. She told me like when to rest. She helped me with my pace up the mountain. There was 50% less oxygen, y'all. It was hard to breathe up there. I felt like I was suffocating. Ever felt that way? I felt like I was going to die at times. Ever felt that way? I felt like there's no way I'm going to be able to get to the top of this mountain in below freezing temperatures, freezing, windy. My camel, water in my camelback froze. All, it was so dark, all you could see was what was in front of me with my headlamp. One step at a time, that's all I could take. And Cindy was like, follow every step I take. I've been here before. If you follow me, you won't fall. Each step that she took, I placed my foot there. Come on, church. Who is following behind you? Who is following that you needs to see what steps you are taking to climb the mountain of life, to get free. Who are you bringing along on the journey of life? Who are you engaging in your greater purpose? See, she, I was um, like Mordecai, the mentor, and uh, no, I'm sorry, um, Cindy Zello was my Mordecai, my mentor, and I was Esther. And now as an Esther, with that anointing on my life, I go around sharing my story of recovery, of overcoming alcohol addiction in my life. I am five years, five months sober, proudly boasting of what Christ has done in my life. And I will never stop boasting of what he has done in my life because you know what? When people hear me share my story, they think, hmm, authenticity, transparency, maybe I could do this too. Guys, we can't keep quiet. 
Verse 14 in, um, in, in verse 414 says, if you keep quiet like a t- at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place and you and your relatives will die. I believe that's a warning for us. We cannot keep quiet. We've got to share our stories. I remember when the Lord put that burning on my heart that I had to become, go public with my story of how God redeemed my marriage restored my family and delivered me from alcohol addiction and PTSD and trauma. And now my greatest misery has become my greatest ministry. God is amazing. Church, we have generations are at stake. If we don't share with the next generation, my children wouldn't know. If I hadn't shared with them what happened uh, to me and what had, uh, I'd learned in AA meetings, they would not know that they are at risk for alcoholism as well. That addiction is in our family. Generations are at stake. Are you ready to be the one in your family that makes a decision that it stops with me? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a a, a divorce in your family is the legacy. Maybe it's mental health issues in your family. I don't know whatever it is, but you got to face it and you got to say it and then you got to work through it. And all those kids are going to be watching you. Generations, your coworkers, people are watching you and how you got over so they can get over. And sure enough, once they get over, they'll bring somebody along for the ride as well. You get to be a pact of, uh, uh, get to be a part of impacting generations. Generations, when we encourage them to be the best versions of themselves, train up a child in the ways they should go, and they won't depart from it. They won't forget it. They're watching. It's not just about the kids, y'all. It's about young men and young women behind you that need to hear an encouraging word from you. We've got to engage in them in a greater purpose, be an encourager of God's people. And number three, we've got to enca- teach them how to encounter God's presence. See, Esther was set up for months doing beauty treatments, months of preparation before she could go before the king. My question to you this morning Church, let's get honest and ask ourselves, are we setting up the next generation to come before the king to encounter Jesus? Are we setting them up? Come on, Baltimore. We got to get honest with yourselves. Columbia, you too. All of y'all watching online. Ask yourself that question. Are you helping the next generation seek the presence of God? Are you sharing with them what you learned at church? Your experience at Freedom Conference? How many of you were at Freedom Conference? Freedom Conference is amazing. Talk about breaking generational stuff. We do some work there. You hear me? It's holy work, sacred work that happens at Freedom Conference. Are you coming home and sharing with your children sharing with perhaps the young lady at church, the, the young lady at the gas station, the young man that's uh, on, the, on, on the track team, uh, another dad that's in the stands with you at football games, sharing your experiences of freedom and how God has set you free so that they can know that it could happen for them too. Like, We've got to teach them to seek the presence of God where it's not just about seeing God, uh, asking God for a miracle or uh, asking God for provision, but seeking his presence to see his face, to encounter him, spend time with him, love on him. And like, we got to do it so that they can see us doing it and then share our experience. I was so blessed, my daughter Kayla, This is like a massive moment as a parent. We had Freedom Conference two weeks ago, and she um, was at the altar praying and seeking God for herself. The presence of God hit her so hard in a fresh and a new way that she was not expecting. 
She had been skeptical that this was even real, that this could happen to people. Yeah, pastor's kid. She'd been in church all her life, but she was looking around, the presence of God coming on people the way it was happening at Freedom Conference. She was like, I don't know if that's real. Can we, get, can we be honest here? People, people think that. So Kayla, the Lord slams dunks her, slam dunks her. Literally, she has an encounter with God. It radically changed her life. She comes home. She shares this experience for, um, for, with us and says, I, I had to repent to God because I didn't believe it, but then I experienced it myself. And these are the decisions I'm making for my life moving forward. Y'all, she heard God for herself. As a parent, come on. I celebrate that. She didn't hear God through her mama, her daddy, who are pastors. She experienced God for herself. Don't we want that for this next generation? We want them to experience God for themselves, encounter him. And we have to create environments and opportunities for them to do so. Y'all, could it be that it's as simple as you inviting someone to church? Could it be that God just wants you to have the courage to invite someone to church, open your mouth, invite someone to church, and you know what's at stake? Generations. You got to rise to the occasion and be courageous enough to ask. Do the ask. Why don't you come to church? Meet this Jesus that has radically changed my life and set me free. And literally, you could be Literally, God could want to use you to impact that one person who goes home and tells their family about Jesus. Suddenly, the whole family's at Freedom Conference, and they're breaking generational curses and creating a new legacy of freedom, a legacy of, uh, of, of relationship with Christ. You could be impacting generations. What an important thing that God has called us to for such a time as this. For such a time as this, we've got to engage in a greater purpose and encourage God's people, encounter God's presence. We've got to teach them that. And lastly, we've got to equip them with a perhaps. Church, perhaps means simply this. As a mentor... Who are you giving away wisdom to? Like Mordecai did to Esther. Like the eunuchs did when they said, go back into the palace and don't ask, when you go before the king, don't ask for anything. She listened and she gained favor with the king. Literally, the king was like, ooh, I like this chick. I'm making you queen. Just because she didn't ask for anything. She didn't force her intentions on the king. Initially, she waited on God's timing. She to went and told uh, Mordecai and the people, fast for three days. Seek God's presence. Then we'll go asking for something. And she had this supernatural strength from God that came over her, right? She knew the timing of when to approach the king, and it worked out, and she was able to become the hero, a hero to the Jews and save the people from annihilation and genocide. Perhaps for such a time as this, you are called to help someone else push their purpose out. Don't think for a minute that it couldn't happen to you, church. Your relatives might die if you don't. Share, engage, teach them to encounter God's presence. When people look at my life, sometimes I, I ask myself this question. Do they see the work that God's done in me? Because when I share my testimony of overcoming addiction, I don't just do it to get cheers. Although I thank God for that because that means y'all are celebrating with me what God has done. But my goal is to equip you with a perhaps. Perhaps if she overcame addiction, 
then God can help me overcome addiction. Perhaps if she's so transparent, and I love that authenticity about her, God can teach me to be authentic and tell me when to share my story and with who. Perhaps if she can be the first in her family to become an author, thank you, Jesus, perhaps you could be one too. Who are you sharing with? Who are you leading? Who is following you that you're sharing that perhaps they can be the first in their generation to get a college degree? Perhaps they can see miracle signs and wonders happen in their lives. Perhaps God can do miracles and open. I'm hearing this right now in the spirit. God is opening wombs of women who have been waiting for children for a long time, and you've been praying and crying. Just like Hannah, bearing down in the, in, in, in the temple, crying her eyes out, wait, petitioning God for a child that literally they thought she was drunk. Keep pressing, keep praise, praying, no matter how ugly, crazy you look. I want to encourage you today that God's going to a year from now, this will be a different Mother's Day. In Jesus' name, if that's you and you want to receive that, <laughs> receive it now. We can learn so much from Esther, y'all. Courage breeds courage. Can you step out of your comfort zone today? Engage with someone? Teach them, tell them who they are in God, about their purpose, what God's called them to. Can you step into your purpose and be a mentor in the, to the next generation? We can't keep silent about the things of God. What's at stake? A generation not knowing and not understanding that God exists. He fearfully and wonderfully created them. He loves them so much that he gave his, his life. Jesus gave his life. God gave his only begotten son so that we could have everlasting life, that our sins could be washed white as snow, thrown as far as the east is for the, from the west. God is calling us to rise up with a sense of urgency for the next generation, to lead them, to guide them, Get the ones that are aimless and hopeless. Give them hope. But we need the Esthers to rise up and courageously insist on encountering God and approaching the king. I promise you, God will extend his scepter. He's always got open arms. He loves you. We can't pass stumbling blocks to our kids, y'all. We got to share our stories, share our experiences and encourage them that if it happened to me, trust me, it's not so bad. You'll make it through this. If you are ready to become a part of God's army, to take territory back, to mentor the, the motherless and the fatherless in the next generation, and you want to rise up for such a time as this, would you stand with me? I want to pray for you. I believe God's calling his whole church, men and women, all of us, to revive, restore, repair our families. Revive, restore, repair our families. Bring the hope of Jesus Christ. And in that healing that's gonna happen in you, it'll happen in your family, and then it'll happen in your community but it starts with you. Say, it starts with me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you that you're giving us a heart for orphans, for the motherless and the fatherless. God, put people in our paths that we can hug on, love on, share our stories with, encourage, invite to church. God, Help every heart that comes our way get the healing and restoration and freedom that you so generously have to offer us. 
God, for the ones who've been hurt and wounded by authority figures and mothers and fathers, God, I pray that you would give them a restored vision, forgiveness in their hearts, a restored vision for what it looks like to have healthy mothers and fathers, not perfect mothers and fathers, but ones that share their brokenness and their humanity. God, let us rise up to the occasion. Be what we might not know how to be in the moment, but trust, we trust that you will guide us, lead us, teach us, so that we can transfer information and wisdom and the ways of God to the next generation. In your name, we pray for this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all, I want to, I'm not going to leave without asking you this question. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and made him just Lord of your life, it's not some super hard ceremony. It's a decision and a choice you make in a simple prayer we can pray that can begin your journey with Jesus. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he, was he died on the cross for our sins so that, and was on the third day was rose again and is seated in heaven with the Father for eternity, that we are saved. We are forgiven of our sins. We're saved from ourselves. It's not some weird, crazy meaning. So if that's you and you want some of that Jesus, some of that energy, some of that, you know, um, forgiveness, some of that power, some of that Holy Spirit and guidance and wisdom, you can receive him. Can we pray this prayer together as a church and encourage those who want to receive Jesus? Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Thank you for washing my sins away. I receive you as my savior. I believe in your healing power. And I pray that you would help me be the best version of myself, a child of God, all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give it up for all those who made the best decision you have ever made in your entire life. I love you all. Thank you for having, letting me share.